Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Styria, Steiermark, the Marca Carentana and other names that were attributed at different times to, to the region, to the historical region, that in fact was first a mark then a duchy, as a matter of fact, and that illustrates beautifully the southeastern German frontier with the Slavic world, and essentially the uh, the political institutional building in this frontier area as such. Um, Styria has an interesting history even before it was Styria, right? What we call as, in fact, Steiermark is um, a product of a, a medieval districtuation. It didn't exist mm, per se, right, um, in uh, before medieval times, but it still overlaps with, in fact, uh, an important area. Uh, historically, just east of the Alps, and that uh, was inhabited um, from, say, starting from the Iron Age, from from the Celts, um, from Hallstatt to Latin times. Uh, it fundamentally hosted Noricum, the kingdom of Noricum, um, structured around today's Klagenfurt. Uh, it was eventually conquered by the Romans. Romanized and the historical boundaries of Styria that fundamentally overlap in the upper part of today's um, Austrian Bundesland, that is the largest um, after Lower Austria, and the second part, the great part of Slovenia. Uh, in terms of Roman provinces, actually, also a part of Pannonia was included by the, the later. Um, historical region, uh, but was mostly centered on the Noricum and especially the so-called Mediterranean one, what is called as Binnen Noricum uh, in German, e essentially the one from the um, southern uh, watershed of, of the Alps. And that would be, as we will see now, an important core also from the Carantanian mark right through Slavization, but also probably from before, right, if you look at the settlements of various peoples, especially the Rugi and the Longbirds that stayed there for, for a longer time, but briefly also the Ostrogoths, and um, so all peoples that were fundamentally um, just condensating east of the Alps because of some kind of overlordship at some point, at least talking for the um, the Ostrogoths specifically, and later even for the Slavs in relation respectively to the Huns and the Avars, right? Because these are in fact the, the Alpine, pre-Alpine part. Also lowlands at the outskirts of the, uh, what would become the, the Hungarian plain, right? And thus remaining that important area frontier later on, so between Austria and Hungary, um, and where lots, in fact, of uh, interesting things were happening regarding this, but from one side the Germans, from one side the, the Magyars, from one side the Slavs, and especially between the Germans and the Slavs, um, uh, an important hybrid occurring in between, so that still as today's toponyms, as we will see, but properly also the split between Austria and Slovenia, we can appreciate this kind of different backgrounds that, however, were blurred, right, from, from the Alpine side, generally speaking, was more German, and uh, down the, the river valley is more, more Slavic. Uh, but this depends also on which areas uh, specifically, and you can't quite even distinguish it at some point, because this mix began quite early, right? Uh, from 595, the ancestors of the Slovenes invaded Mediterranean North. Probably via the valleys of the Sava, the Trau, and the Zan, so settling uh, in that mode that we have seen in multiple videos that the Slavs were, were used to, right? Mostly um, uh, autonomous clans, surely under uh, some overlordship that could be Slav or you know Iranian or or even Turkic at that point, uh, and uh, that literally transformed the local. Uh, ethnicity. Of course, there were other peoples inhabiting there, so mostly this uh, Celto-Roman Germanic populations. Uh, 
in fact, about the Celto Romans, we don't know exactly what happened. We we made videos about how you know the broader cultural identity would shift independently from the say the the genetic origins, right? So that the area becomes fundamentally German and Slav, right? But there is that important background plus surely other influences from from these other peoples. Um, and the area, as we've seen, had um, gone un undepopulated historically uh, during the, the late Roman Empire, the migration era, for which m preferably whoever lived from, um, you know, from the other side of the Alps would prefer to enter Italy. And this is what fundamentally, in fact, the the Ostrogoths, the Longobards, uh, did, um, thus leaving space to this other central European populations that instead became, in fact, the, mostly the Slavic frontier, in which the Principality of Carantania, in fact, was founded. So what about the name? Because eventually Carantania would give the name to today's Carinthia. But that's in in the sense that Syria late, right? It was a, a, a bigger Carantania that eventually uh, shrank by name to, to today's Carinthia, but that encompassed large parts, in fact, almost the entirety of today's Styria, right? The etymology of this word is uncertain. It could become from the uh, Proto-Indo-European car, which has to do with rocks, mountains, which is appropriate for, for the landscape, at least in the upper part. Um, otherwise, um, you could see a Celtic etymology um, stressing the idea of allies of some sort of, you know, political contract uh, at the base of this. Uh, it's still debated, but fundamentally, you know, it's not even this, this huge deal, especially later medieval times where, as we, as we were seeing, the political and territorial dominations would change shape, form, name, and so on. Around 740, Boroth, that was the Duke of Carantania, so a Slavic overlord of, of the province, approached the Duke Odila of Bavaria for help against the Avars. This was a moment of uh, Avar resurgence after the uh, crisis of, of the previous generations. That's where, in fact, also they began to, to harass this broader uh, frontier of, of the more uh, sedentary, at least um, ancestrally sedentary populations, the Germans, the Slavs. Uh, at the same time, that's where, as we will see, the Franks will intervene. Um, under Charlemagne, but already the Bavarians fundamentally uh, extend this Bavarian, and by extension, in fact, by proxy, Frankish supremacy already on the principality of, of Carantania, because the military help was offered from Bavaria that naturally was more, mm, kind of more advanced, right, more resourceful. Those were also, say, the, the entire Danubian frontier was not particularly um, Romanized uh, from a cultural point of view, except perhaps Moesia, but um, it was a military frontier, so a great deal of that infrastructure, fortifications, etc., had remained all along the Danube because it it had remained a frontier area, right? In this case, between the the Bavarians and the Slavic war, but especially the upper war. So what happens is that basically the Carantanians lose their own political independence because they are pressured by the others that they cannot counter because they're uh, too too big and uh, enclosed for for the Slavs uh, of the Alpine foothills to to resist, and uh, they pass under this Bavarian protection that, as we will see, regionally speaking, will be a bit. Um, the the future of the country because this was the bigger Bavaria the the the, the high the, the the early and high medieval one right that encompassed areas in fact as far as the from, from the other side of the Alps even in Italy and that would break down over time strictly as such and, and not that the 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 lands of today's Bavaria proper ever managed to directly rule over these areas where you took uh, a long time, especially in in the Slavic frontier, to properly 
uh, extend the basalitic beneficiary system, creating more stable, permanent, um, and solid uh, administrative governmental uh, forms, uh, etc. Uh, what is worth noticing is that the Principality of Carantania had been, however, the first um, Slavic principality that was firmly established east of, of the Alps. Um, and thus, it, it already evidences a, an important base, um, per se. In fact, uh, even if we look at the, the longer birds, the Rugi, etc., they had mostly ruled, actually from the north, what is today's lower Austria, fundamentally. Uh, they occupied other areas like Moravia, etc. So, what you see there is something similar to what um, later, um, the, the later Burgic uh, possessions, um, of the Archduchy of Austria, in fact, would, would actually become right. Al already, this idea was an important center around areas like um, Vienna or or Carnuntum, etc., that could control even the southern lands is important. But Styria um, would emerge from an important core um, that had somehow developed autonomously, still within uh, this broader domination was affirmed by the Franks and that does have the important root in the aforementioned principality. And if you look at the toponyms of Slavic origin that still exist today in Styria, in historical Styria of course from this um, Slavic in Slovenia you, you find of course the, the Slavic name just per se, but in the Austrian part, uh, even though they're not always immediately recognizable as such, you realize this southeastern areas um, bear trace um, of the extent of the Slavic settlement uh, during the migration era. There is Celia, for example, um, there are the, just a, some of the most famous centers, but uh, it's uh, like if you have a map and you want to have fun with, you know, with the toponyms, you can check this kind of things. Of course, there was a Germanization of the same Slavic names, but very often it still the, the substratum is recognizable, as you can find in many other, just by consonants. If you if you look at even countries like today's Czech Republic, or you know, if you look at Silesia, uh, Slovakia, etc., there are historically lots of names that were German historically, and that now we call with the Slavic names. So you you, you can understand there how even how it works uh, linguistically in, in the shift. Um, what the, the, the reason why they're somehow more difficult to recognize is that this blend, it, it was literally a blend occurring very early in time. That because, of course, the, the Principality of Carantania still was established over, as we've seen, essentially Celto-Roman Germanic already populations, right? So it's not that when, say, I don't know, the Ostrogoths or the Longobards left the area for Italy, they, they literally all went, like there was nobody uh, left there. Actually, there was a trail, lots of people that simply remained there, um, and of course the blend was as uh, old as that. Um, so it's fair to say that the, the principle of the Carantans was polyethnic. Uh, it represents the old early medieval tribal formation that took place east of the Alps from immigrants and locals. And the Carantanians were clearly s Slavic. Right, but they still had a non-Slavic name, apparently. Right, uh, they at least either took the name of the land where they settled, which does happen, uh, and or they they called this name um, on the base of some other linguistical base, because we we don't witness it before them. Right. Um, in the decades following the uh, Bavarian conquest, the Carantanians were able to push back the influence of the others, right? So these uh, German overlords arrive, they are already well, you know, developed politically and socially in, this, in that vassalatic beneficiary system to have, again, um, a very effective land management, um, this um, important military elite that was becoming but gradually really something in terms of collective training, de facto professionalism, um, and they brought also like immigrants, 
the extended, the cultivated areas, right? This was a moment in Europe where, uh, of course, also from from a local um, perspective, these things were growing, were increasing. The problem was this, the, the say, the fact that uh, this, um, this Slavic populations at the outskirts of the other Kaganate had not had the, the, the chance, given this cumbersome neighbor, to develop more centralized um, a government and administration, uh, in part because they also lacked the resources, because the resources were also tributed to the um, other Kagans, right? So that was the point. So now the Germano Slavic uh, combination allows the land also to, to consolidate, to expand from the within uh, and more, very gradually because troubles were not over and again this would always remain a frontier area as we will see now quite hot one um, but um, it, it, it's evident that the the cooperation works successfully because uh, the Carantanians with the help of the Bavarians rep repulsed the attackers together right the, the Carantans became under Bavarian suzerainty but this fundamentally was from one side nominal from essentially the the Dutch of Bavaria that was also distant as you understand also from the other side of the Alps so mostly what happened was again uh, of course certain Germanic lords settling marrying to the Slavic nobility but the latter still having powerful lordships right um, scattered uh, um, across the the province, and so it was not like a complete takeover, as you understand. It's sort of a cooperation, and of course the Bavarians were interested in that because it meant to first of all extend their uh, domination, but securing the border, creating uh, w with the uh, with this the the, the others, creating uh, a buffer zone, or at least um, reinforcing it, and also again providing. Um, with uh, many, many people with the opportunity of settling elsewhere, colonizing, uh, having new lands to work and so on. As a part of Carantania, the areas that would later become Styria came under Bavarian rule thus from the middle uh, 8th century and then from 788 under Carolingian rule, you know that Charlemagne, we were talking about just the other day, talking about the, the Carolingian Empire boundaries, takes over Bavaria at this point, that was ruled by his cousin Tassilo III, that uh, had tried to remain somehow detached from direct uh, Carolingian control, signing with the Longobards at some point, etc. But, you know, there was not much really he could do, especially after the Longobard kingdom had fallen at the hands of the same uh, Carolingians and so on. But as you understand, exactly these conquests, right, the, uh, the conquest of Italy, the reinforcement of the Danubian frontier under a single Frankish uh, overlordship, uh, bring all these lands within a, a bigger system, right, also under an important uh, ecclesiastical reform, um, political territorial reorganization, military development, Right, so uh, there is also an important coordination, as we've seen, for example, in the history of the Mark of Friuli, or the one of, of Verona, and uh, in the video about the Duchy of Bavaria, and the one about um, medieval Austria, right, between all these lands, right, the, the Slavic frontier, first of all, the Avar Kaganate is destroyed, that's the most important thing, right, Charlemagne carries out this this incredible operation, in fact, using all these peoples, like the Bavarians, uh, the long burst, uh, even these uh, Slavic lords, uh, next to the, um, you know, core of, of the Frankish um, Skara, if we can call them like this. Um, and it, it's a massive thing logistically, it's an amphibious operation supporting the land army from the Danube and essentially crushing the, uh, frankly, unknown, uh, our capital, it was essentially a massive a ring fort where all the tributes, all the, the, the various peoples um, around the, the, you know, the, the, the Pannonian plain uh, had been collected um, and seizing the area that would 
remained somehow decentralized, and that's where at the end of, of the um, of the 9th century, the, the Magyars would settle, so recreating actually a big problem, especially for, for the Eastern Frankish kingdom, but not only. Um, but in beyond that, being their Slavic principalities, we've, been, uh, we've seen, for example, the, the Duchy of Croatia, that was like a bit in between the Carolingians, the Byzantines, so these were exactly kind of the, the frontier areas where a lot was, was often going on, there was a lot of turmoil, you wouldn't understand whether beyond some periodic raiding there was just in fact local um, uh, brutality per se or uh, you know concerted international effort with an army coming out of, of, of anywhere say backed by the Byzantines or things like that so that's a very interesting area to observe we'll have to make a video specifically about the principality of Carantania and uh, the, the Pannonian Slavs, etc., because we haven't actually dealt with them actively, and especially in this time between the, you know, the destruction of the Avar Khaganate and the Magyar settlement. Um, thus, as a broader picture, at the beginning of the ninth century, the Slavic princes of Carantania were also replaced by Frankish border counts of uh, mostly Bavarian descent. Um, because as militarized as the frontier was becoming, um, as the, the more the Carolingians uh, invested resources in there, of course, the more it was, there was a, a direct control of, on, on the land. Uh, the country was thus incorporated into the broader Carolingian Empire um, for good, right? At least, at least from a Frankish perspective, the, the districtuation of these lands would remain as part of their um, of the Eastern Frankish Kingdom specific. Um, as we were saying before, the, the, the Franks had even, even gone beyond uh, Carantania uh, during the, even starting from the end of the, the 8th century, right? Uh, Carolingian rule extended deep into the Pannonian region beyond Lake Balaton, right? And that's when the Carantanian and Pannonian provinces of the empire were established as such. Um, and what would become East Styria belonged to actually the latter, right? So this more this Pannonian rather than Carantanian uh, area. With the incursions of the Magyars uh, that raided extensively, as you know, in, in, uh, in Central Europe in the 9th century, all areas of the aforementioned Pannonia, so roughly the areas of today's, uh, e say, east of the Syrian mountain range, were initially lost by the Carolingians. If you look at all the Magyar expeditions, like they, they didn't even care so much to raid those uh, areas that remain under um, Carolingian control immediately. They just wanted to enter properly the, the Frankish heartland as far as like uh, in, in the Rhineland, northeastern Gaul, northern Italy, they, they arrived even in Spain, right? So um, areas like um, Carantania were just, you know, the, the gates that were immediately crossed. And it's as if the, the Magyars didn't even, you know, care to, to look there. Also because, in fact, they, they were de facto extending an important degree of... Mm, political influence, to say the least, even on the Germanic-ruled um, areas. In fact, it would have not possible for the Magyars to, to do what they did if basically many uh, Carolingian or post-Carolingian counts hadn't literally let them cross their, their possessions uh, while entrenching uh, during the, the the process in their own castles, just to say, okay, just loot somewhere else for now, we will let you pass here so we, we don't want to travel. That's literally what happened. And as you understand, th this area of Carantania was pretty, um, you know, pretty permeable in that, in that sense. Um, the thing went on, as you know, for a long time from the end of the 9th century to uh, 955 with Otto the First, uh, Holy Roman Emperor great victory in the Battle of Lechfeld. Uh, and this had happened 
actually uh, obscuring historiographically, because that's mostly the only battle that we remember. Also, the one of Riade by Henry the, the Fowler in 933 was was remarkable. But really, the unsung heroes of you know that the the Magyar defeat were the Bavarians that. Mm, as you know, were a bit like the rival branch of the Ottonian dynasty, and um, for this reason, didn't receive so much credit, recognition, and spotlight as their Saxon uh, cousins, uh, let's say. But uh, ac across this frontier, the, the Bavarians and also these um, local Slavic lords had managed to inflict the Magyars an important uh, amount of of defeat, right? Some were literally pitched battles, but it was mostly, as you understand, a war of attrition uh, across the frontier. So that's how brutal and militarized and wild that this area uh, really was, right? And uh, the the compaction of also of of, of the land politically by methods of still is um, the need for cohesion against this common threat probably that catalyzed dramatically the development of this area in, in feudal times uh, later. After Lechfeld, the Magyars fundamentally stopped launching their uh, usual raids in, in Western Europe. They turned for a while um, towards the Byzantine Empire, but eventually they decided that the times of the steps were over, and so they literally settled for a um, for a more stable political territorial domination that uh, stemmed essentially from a failure and so had to bring, uh, also had brought risks to the country so they needed to eventually expand their principality further into a kingdom, a Christian one at that point. And this uh, essentially relatively normalized the relation with uh, the Germanic Empire but the, the era would always remain pretty frontier like naturally geography is important like the the most um alpine subalpine lands were um also more forested by degree so they were more difficult and less remunerative to to raid uh, etc so that most competition between austria and bohemia hungary would mostly revolve around the north today's lower austria um mostly um, which is not steer as a matter of fact but still those places events uh, affected importantly the area the borders of Bavaria as part of the Holy Roman Empire as found refound let's say by the Ottonians were pushed east further after the Magyar defeat and thus marches were established as border counties this included the so-called Carantanian mark between the um, Cor Alpe and the Moor, and then to the south the mark of the Drava and the mark of the San rivers. Um, these were military colonies, essentially, uh, still designed to stem the Hungarian threat. In 976. Emperor Otto II separated Carantania from the Bavarian Duchy together with the marches of Friuli, of Istria, of Carniola, and the Carantinian mark, thus including the, the, the Marsh region on the Drava and the Zan, raising it all together to the Duchy of Carinthia. Right. Under King Henry III, the borders of the Carantanian mark against Hungary were pushed forward for good to the Lafnitz in 1043, and East Styria was thus incorporated into the mark. So here we have basically the major political territorial settlement in feudal times during the 11th century between Germany and Hungary. Right. And, of course, the Germans are in a condition of strength uh, from, from their side. Naturally, all this was accompanied by 
the process of Ost Siedlung, still more especially in this Slavic areas, right, that were just being Germanized by an important extent at this point, right? Uh, but the thing was relentless. It went on for a long time. So it managed to sediment eventually an important German presence over time. Um, the entire property had technically become the Frankish kings, right? And um, it was important, especially in these frontier areas, to reinforce territorial settlement. Reason for which um, the German colonization of the Eastern Alpine countries started with the purpose of making better use of this extensive yet sparsely populated lands. After all, the land lo lords brought in German settlers, most of whom again were from the territories of the old Bavaria, um, and we can assess, in fact, this happening mostly from 955 onwards. Before that, it's still basically a, a, a Slavic land by overwhelming majority, or at least any other traceable uh, ethnicity. From the 10th century onwards, thus Germans and Slavs settle side by side in Carantania, probably as populations. Again, in the 8th century, it was mostly like a broader overlordship with just some Germanic lord with some mil military retinue that would essentially enter the, the, the chief domes of the local Slavic lords. Right? Th that point is that you have literally the uh, also the peasant, for say, becoming German practice. Of course, this was part of a bigger process that was not just even um, uh, ruled by by the above. Of course, there had been some German settlers historically who had, had descended from from the north, from the Alps, and started living among the Slavs. But what, what is important here is ethnicity as juridical identity, as also feudal um, uh, identity, as in as much as of course the Slavic elite wants to be Germanized as it enters the the bigger circle. Uh, in order to be co-opted by the important levels of, of the feudal hierarchy. Uh, and this is also the reason why there is not a strict language barrier separating geographically the, the Germans and the Slavs. Right? In, in the march uh, on, on the uh, Drau and the Zan, the Slavic settlement was denser just because it was just downstream um, towards um, the rest of, of, of Slavic Europe um, and uh, compared of course to, to the northern areas um, and this also meant which apart from a few towns fewer German settlers immigrated in the more densely populated areas of, of the Slavs. Starting from Salzburg that is a bit the spiritual guide of, as you know, of the entire Bavarian, so th this major region, as it was still intended, in spite of the important divides um, uh, across the Alps. Christianity gradually spread to the Carantanian regions because the area had, of course, been Christian since Roman times, formally, especially among the elites, etc., but very superficially. Uh, the Avars had remained uh, pagan. Uh, the Slavs also originally were as uh, uh, Central European settlers in Christian land. So in Carolingian, post-Carolingian times, there's a big deal of, not just of Christianization proper, but also of re-Christianization and or of improvement of Christian standards uh, in so, namely Christian areas. Salzburg had been raised to the status of a metropolitan see, famously enough. Um, it basically uh, had the, the primacy in Germany, because historically Bavaria had been the center of the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, right? Uh, before, before the Saxons and eventually the Franconians 
took power um, and promoted the Christianization of the Carantanians. Uh, in 1056, the Carantanian mark was awarded to Ottokar von Steyr. Ottokar is a famous name. Think about Ottokar van der Gaal, um, basically the Styrian Dante that wrote like uh, the Steyrische Reimkönig. It's, it's a 100,000 verses work uh, from the early 14th century. It's an incredible source, um, late medieval times. Um, Otaka of Steyr was the first margrave from the Traungau family that was in turn a relative of the Lambach clan. Uh, the main castle of the Traungau was Steyr. Gradually, thus, the name Styria instead of Karantanermark, so Steyr, and Steiermark in German, as Syria is fundamentally known, in that language, and Syria being the, the Latin version of it, uh, became common. Right? That's how the Carantanian ethnos was separated, right? And um, it passed essentially just to the Duchy of Carinthia, in fact, that is the one that bears the, uh, the name, right? the, the legacy. Of the ancient Carantanian uh, mark by name. And when, in fact, the Dukes of Carinthia, the Eppensteins, died out in 1122, large areas of their allodial possessions, which were mainly located in Upper Styria, fell to the Traungau family as well, um, who was related to the Eppenstein. Um, and the Traungau were for this reason, able to use these assets to consolidate their power as Styrian margraves. In fact, under Ottokar III, who took over the administration of the mark around 1139-40, the provincial principality of Styria, as we intended historically, began to emerge as such. Right, um, So, as you understand, just essentially a feudal name, right, of some dynastic compaction uh, occurred for patrimonial reasons. And this is typical of many countries in Europe that thus, that today they exist, but they wouldn't have any other base on that. And the name of Styria, in fact, comes from, uh, from the, the, the town of Steyr. Uh, the coat of arms of which that was of, of the Traungau family became, in fact, the one of the of the land of today's land, which is a, a panther spitting fire, right? A uh, white panther uh, on a green uh, field that is to be found everywhere in Styria. Now we will talk about Graz because you know that that's actually today's uh, Styrian. Uh, capital, but the 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 panther is literally from Steyr, and if you enter the uh, Rathaus in Graz, in the internal cloister, you have at least there was it some years ago. I was there, there like a I don't remember whether a wall, the internal wall, or it was even just a gate for for carts, and so it was this huge panther um, on a you know sprayed on it in all in, in white and green. And it is very, uh, is very, is very typical, and you can find the same panther, of course, on the, literally uh, on the seals of the margraves of Styria, camping on the shield of, of the knight, right? And as we have seen, as the dolphin in Dauphiné, and so on. It was pretty typical, especially in the 12th century uh, iconography. Um, the high and noble free families of Syria who owned the most important and, and most fertile areas mm -hmm. represented the greatest obstacle, though, in the enforcement of the country ruled by the Traungau. Right? This is now feudal high middle ages. And uh, the, the greatest problem is the decentralization. The area had been expanding, growing, so all these local... Um, lordships had expanded, had built castles, and 
a, a centralized government was de facto impossible. So um, aside from the uh, international struggles that continued between Hungary, Germany, um, and also other players in the area, uh, these local Styrian rulers were pretty much involved in uh, internal strife, right? As you can imagine, in the most typical nightly fashion, mostly sieges, raids, uh, occasionally some pitch battle, continuously, right? These were men of, of arms, as basically all the European um, nobility. Alpacar the third is important because he succeeded in taking over the center of the mark that is the the basin of, of Graz uh, where the final capital of the country in fact came into being right Graz is the, still today in fact the second largest city in in the entire Austrian Bundesland as a testament to steer and importance but also of how you know polycentric of course these um, uh, landed lordships really were right uh, Graz was a more important center in their style or, or at the time but you know it could still decay for, for other reasons or across history so um, it's a complex sum of possessions that today we can't just go in particular detail in or if you're interested at some point we could even do it Ottakar also inherited large estates in Lower Styria, which today lay in Slovenia. Um, and this land mostly stretched as far as the Sava, right, and the, the, the Mark of Pitten in today's Lower Austria as well. Um, so you understand how scattered uh, these possessions could be. From an ecclesiastical point of view, the area of the Margraviate of Styria, as it was now factually called, belonged still, of course, to the Archdiocese of Salzburg, that had also become a major uh, ecclesiastical lordship in Germany, right? Salzburg, taking its name from its um, salt production was just exported uh, along the Danube up to Constantinople and accumulating an enormous wealth, right, controlling also the Alpine passes uh, in Bavaria, the connections between Germany and Italy and so on, so, uh, at least some of them. Um, and so the, even just the spiritual prestige of the sea was uh, reaching Styria and uh, that's where uh, the local church was administered from. Uh, and the church contributed dramatically to the further expansion of, uh, of Styria. A number of monasteries, in fact, were uh, founded. And some of them are really beautiful. Um, there are some however booked historically. There are especially beautiful frescoes from the 12th century. It was, in fact, the moment of greatest expansion. The Gus Abbey was founded in 1020 by the Bavarian Count Palatine family of the Aribonen. In 1074, Archbishop Gebhard II of Salzburg founded the monastery of Admont. In 1096, the Eppenstein family, the monastery of St. Lambrecht. Then there were other foundations in the 12th century, the Cistercian Abbey of Rhine in 1129, the Abbey of Zakau in 1140, in 1163 sites, um, the, the Slovenian Bijice in 1164, uh, and Spital am Zemmering in 1164. As you understand, all these monasteries, abbeys, etc., were fundamentally private foundations where they were one of the most profitable investments you could make at the time because they enjoyed essentially the ecclesiastical immunity and as long as you could place some cadet son or, or daughter as um, abbot, uh, some were bishops as well of course they had the, the higher authority even in the ecclesiastical hierarchy but also just locally to maintain the monastery its resources because these were powerful lordships on their own. The, the monasteries had lands, people living, working on them and uh, 
paying tributes and, and the monasteries had their own military retinues and so on. So that's a very important moment, of course. Uh, the 12th century has this enormous impetus all over Europe um, and in Central Europe is uh, mostly embodied by the Ost Zidlung, right? So these Eastern marches were importantly colonized and uh, consolidated further. In 1180, Syria became a duchy, right? This is the important passage from the Mark to the duchy, um, which occurred within the frame of the struggle between the Welfs and the Hohenstaufen. Margrave Ottokar IV was appointed duke by the Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa. This mechanism was closely related to the deposition of Henry the Lion from his Bavarian possessions. As you know, Henry was demoted, um, exiled, uh, because he had opposed himself to, to the king. So he, the, the Welfen at that point had been ruling uh, from a while both in Saxony and Bavaria. So they represented kind of a counter axis uh, to the imperial one of Swabian Franconia. And uh, Henry was, for reasons that actually are not so obvious as they would sound, because they had mostly to do with the harassment of churches in the Rhineland, in Westphalen, and so on. And Frederick didn't even have much reason to... Um, to expropriate, let's say, his cows and literally from that. But th as we've seen in the videos about medieval Bavaria and medieval Austria, this brought to this fundamental breaking down and uh, the strict uh, re, um, repartition of, of the land. In fact, now, Styria was a duchy as a fief of the empire on the same grounds of Carinthia, Bavaria and Austria that all enjoyed thus equal rights. In other words, Bavaria had been degraded um, to the same uh, status of these other lands that had previously been instead uh, its possessions since, as we've seen, high medieval times, even before. Um, as a consequence, all the Styrian feudal ties to Bavaria at this point expired. Right, so Styria was technically now, for the first time, like just directly communicating with the Holy Roman Emperor. This doesn't mean, of course, that it, it still didn't um, receive important influence from the uh, surrounding lands, but especially the one with Bavaria, especially with the rise of Austria, as we will see now in the, the Babenberg, etc., made it fall under um, other centers' influence. Since Margrave Ottokar IV was terminally ill with leprosy and had no male hairs, well, a hell of a situation, he concluded a contract of succession in Styria in 1186 with the Babenberg Leopold V of Austria, right, who was actually related to the Traungau family. The Babenberg were one of the single most powerful feudal families in Europe, right? Had made of Austria uh, at this point one of the single most uh, promising and orderly possessions in the empire with a degree of centralization that was the envy of uh, the other German princes. So to attract actually the same the same aims of the Hohenstaufen, but not only basically of any other neighbor. We, we have seen that in the video about medieval Austria. Ottokar IV died um, in 1192. He was the last of the Traungau family. He was 29. At that point, Emperor Henry VI, on May 24, 1192, in the Diet of Worms, uh, invested Duke Leopold V of Austria and his son Frederick of Styria. That's how the uh, the succession was was accomplished, right? So Austria and Syria were not united in a single fief, as we've seen, because they had just earned um, uh, a, a peerage fundamentally. 
in Henry's father's uh, time, but it, it's already evident that albeit Austria could not simply invade Syria and seize it, but you know could install um, uh, the the du uh, the duke's son as local duke. Um, and this naturally was done with the support of the local nobility. Like you couldn't quite just uh, succeed in air, whatever, and just walk in, right? By feudal, right? Yes, you you could, but you would always meet a lot of resistance if the local nobility had not fundamentally w wouldn't obey you. Actually, they 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 would have just to recognize you in that title, but not necessarily to agree with what your policy was, because they had pre-existing rights and so on. What is interesting is that southern Germany was, um, generally speaking, a more advanced area than the rest of, of the country, except perhaps the, the Rhineland. Um, and as we've seen often, most of these lands were ruled now by ministeriales rather than by free nobility. Even. And that, that still existed, was, was very powerful, of course. But especially under the Babenberg, the process, let's say, of making leverage on the ministerialis against the local nobility was very pronounced, and that's also what uh, favored uh, the, the Babenberg in, in their, um, in fact, in the creation of, uh, of a broader domain that, let's say, today we look at Austria and we say, oh, this is all Austria, it's all serious Austria. But of course, the different, the, the, there is an important difference in these lines, but the, the moment in which Styria began to be grouped, right, at least under Austria, and not because, as we've seen, Austria was what what had become Austria was not under Bavaria, so already there was some sort of commonality in contact with areas like Vienna and so on that were importantly rising at this point. Um, begins here, it Be begins with the Babenberg and later, of course, with the Habsburgs. Now, the connection of Austria with Styria was also the first step towards the unification of the Eastern Alpine countries, because this broader Austrian possessions would come to include not just Styria, as you know, but also Carinthia and Carniola, to form a unitary wall right up to essentially the Adriatic. The Austrian Babenbergs um, took over um, stable territory, because this Raungau had fundamentally administered well, making of Styria essentially a subsidiary of the Duchy of Austria already, right? Uh, Austria was just larger, more powerful, more already involved in a, in a higher sphere, right, of political gaming, right? The Babenberg, again, had an enormous prestige, as we've seen uh, among crusades, a successful uh, military operation, marriages, uh, etc., and Styria had somehow much less potential just as a land, um, obviously. Uh, Leopold's son, uh, Frederick, and uh, Leopold VI of Austria shared the rulership over Austria and Styria in 1194. But with Frederick's death in 1198, both fell into Leopold's hands, thus actually having a, a single ruler for both countries. This was followed in 1230, again, by Leopold's only son, Frederick de Quarrelson. Um, and since he did not respect the Styrian rights, though, the local nobility filed a complaint with none less than Emperor Frederick II, who reaffirmed the freedoms the Styrians had received in Othakar's will at the time of the Traugau to Babenberg succession. This move was very important because, um, of course, uh, it was avoiding the formation of, a, of an Austrian superstate that already at the time was contributing uh, to the uh, the disgregation of the German national monarchy that would fundamentally uh, uh, accelerate dramatically a few years later with the Edictum in Favorem Principum when Frederick's son is king uh, of Germany associate from 
the same North of the Alps had rebelled to his father, that as you know was involved in pretty, uh, uh, you know, intense uh, affairs in 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 Sicily, in Jerusalem, in Italy. And uh, it it was also an attempt, of course, to still affirm the Hohenstaufen's authority on a land that the same Frederick would have liked to essentially uh, encamerate on his own, to, so to create a super southern German state, summing all the Swabian and all the Austrian uh, assets that were huge, to better control, first of all, the entire Alpine arc, as you understand, so to facilitate a universal policy for the home fact, the, the, the military campaigns between Italy and Germany, and um, essentially giving up that project of centralization in Germany and trying to, to concentrate, in fact, mostly on the Italian peninsula. But things were going to go differently, uh, as you know, both for the Babenberg and the, and the Hohenstaufen, as we will see in a while, because they both failed, but also extinguished themselves, so that new players came in the arena. The desire for provincial dioceses was increasingly brought to the attention of the church, and in particular of the archdiocese of Salzburg, uh, which had also become, as we've seen, an independent provincial principality, plus with you know, ecclesiastical immunity and, and so on. Uh, in order not to be exposed to the opposition of other sovereigns and to avert great political damage to the, arts, uh, the archdiocese, Archbishop Eberhard II, mentioned before, established also several dioceses in his sphere of influence, including the uh, one of Zekau in 1218, that is in Syria, in fact, and in 1225, Lavant, in the Syrian-Carinthian border, which were very strategic places, and showing the increasing interest, in fact, that all the Bavarian, Tyrolean, and next to the, the Austrian uh, interest was in this, this area to, to somehow Germanize, right? Uh, when we will make a video about Tyrol, we will see it better because that was a very important wedge between the ambition of the Habsburgs and the Wittelsbachs and, and uh, carried out a broader uh, policy on all the basically southeastern German lands, including steel. Um, these Syrian, the newly created Syrian dioceses initially included only small areas and relatively few parishes because they had just been established. The bishops were installed, however, by the Archbishop of Salzburg directly, with the administration of his own diocese of Zekau, the bishop also took over the Salzburg general vicariate for the duchy of Styria entirely, right, and this rule um, was valid, right, uh, until basically the end of the 18th century, right, in 1786 there was a, a, a new diocesan regulation, um, so things uh, stayed practically the same, aside from with, with minor changes. But it's relevant, right? Also for a general spiritual history, say in which area did this, you know, did Styria fall um, in terms of ecclesiastical administration? It's, it's a big deal. After the death of the last of the Babenberg, Frederick the Quarrelsome in 1246, without male hands, Right. There was an interregnum uh, all over the lands that the dynasty had possessed. This was a major event in Germany, as we were saying before, because uh, everybody ran to uh, adjudicate themselves, uh, especially the, the Dutch of Austria, but also these other fiefs that had been held, yes, by the dynasty, but as we've seen, were separate at once within the Holy Roman Empire. And this situation was not positive at all for Syria, because naturally there was immediately a, a power vacuum that uh, exposed the countries as if just there was a, a major 
crisis, also economically speaking, because um, not just nobody really invests in you civilly, but does it mostly from a military point of view to try to seize the land, literally. As we've seen, Styria had also grown dependent as far as his defense was concerned to, to, to the Duchy of Austria. The Duchy of Styria, as fifth of the empire, participated to the imperial diet, of course, and one of the German kings as well. We are in a time of interregnum because uh, eventually Frederick II dies, so yes, there is still Conrad. Um, there are lots of other things, however, going on at the same time, and the Hohenstaufen will eventually uh, lose their grip on the country. So there is an advanced stage of privatization of power. Styria um, votes for uh, Henry of Bavaria as Duke in 1253. Right? Um, however, in 1254 it also mediates with the Pope the Peace of Ofen between the kings Ottokar II Premis of Bohemia and Bela the Fort of Hungary. Uh, these were the most powerful contendants for the entire Austrian possessions. You will see this phase better, right? But fundamentally, Ottokar II defeated the Hungarians in 1260 at the Battle of Kressenbrunn on the Markfeld, so that aforementioned area, let's say, um, uh, bordering basically the, the three countries Austria, uh, Bohemia, and uh, and Hungary. Um, with the peace of Vienna 1261, Styria was taken over by Ottokar, who in 1262 was also nominally enfeffed with Austrian Styria by the German uh, king, king of the Romans, actually, Richard of Cornwall, that we were just discussing yesterday as far as Henry III of England's policies um, in Germany were, were concerned. Um, this phase is, we are in, in the heart of the interregnum, and Ottokar II, as king of Bohemia, is de facto the single most powerful ruler in the empire now, right? He controlled Bohemia, Moravia, Austria, Styria, Carinthia, and Carniola, and even other lands, um, but this was essentially the core that he would maintain for some say a relatively short time, but still enough to enormously aggrandize his status. Uh, in Styria, to strengthen his power, the Premislid founded several towns and also had uh, Leoben and Bruck and der Mur rebuilt and fortified because the wars with Hungary had been quite costly. The Viennese uh, bourgeoisie had uh, supported uh, financially the King of Bohemia that relied very much on these towns that provided with important charters. The same had been uh, done in the same native Bohemia. Uh, we'll have to look at Ottokar's reign because it's one of the single most splendid um, of, of the 13th century. Um, for military reason, these cities in Syria were, by the way, built according to a plan around a large rectangular plaza, right? And um, this highlights, of course, also the strategic function that it really had, especially this um, Hungarian frontier, because uh, as we've seen, uh, Ottokar's power base was Bohemia, and you basically have Austria bordering. And that's really the core of the power. But if, say, the Hungarians want to launch raids as far in the south, those are more difficult to reach, right? Um, Ottokar at some point extended his uh, lordship even up to Pordenone. In, in the Friuland plain, right? So just to tell you the extent here of, um, of power, given that he was allied also with Charles of Anjou. And this triggered, naturally, an important reaction um, Europe-wide, because the papacy that, as you know, had basically knocked out the Hohenstaufen by um, launching Charles of Anjou uh, against them, uh, both, you know, killing both Manfred and Conradin, now was like uh, sweating cold because the same Angevins uh, were becoming too powerful, right? And uh, they had allied themselves with Ottokar because um, 
he he mm, essentially was uh, rising as a counter German forces right in Central Europe, and if the German Empire had the task was was also frankly the most um, say likely to eventually mount up new expeditions in Italy and counterbalancing the Angevin power um, had to in fact to, to be safe. The papacy came closer to uh, the German nobility, uh, and that's when. Rudolf of Habsburg, the little count, is elected um, king of the Romans in 1273. Um, this was naturally a reaction against Othokar that was, after all, just, again, a Slavic uh, overlord. It was very Germanized, right? He descended himself from the Hohenstaufen, from his mother's side. Um, and, uh, of course, Bohemia was institutionally part of the Holy Roman Empire, would remain so. Right, but he was still, say, bringing like kind of another side of the story in the German lens that felt like now threatened by such a powerful um, lord uh, that even, in fact, concurred for the the German election because that was, of course, legal and institutional. But Rudolf won because he received papal support, but also the one of the German nobles, including the Styrian, the Carinthian, and the Carniolan one, that in 1276 rose up against King Othokar after the so-called pure oath that was, in fact, sworn to, to get rid of this presence. Rudolf of Habsburg, thanks to this support, managed also to, to take over Austria, and basically Othokar was dislodged from all these south eastern german possessions that had made great part of, of his uh, empire right and planned his coming back in 1278 uh, where a plot in the same vienna against uh, rudolf had to be um, carried out but was discovered in time so that Ottokar marched with an army uh, of um, bohemians but also saxon mercenaries of poles against um, Rudolf, that at this point, however, lacked support from the German princes because he had automatically become so powerful himself that they wouldn't actually uh, support him anymore, except for, in fact, these um, uh, southeastern German possessions, including Styria, that were not just um, in control of the Habsburg, but were fundamentally mostly from, from his side, as far as the broader... Um, Swabian say he they weren't actually so happy of uh, the Habsburgic policy because Rudolf was a quite squared, you know, so straightforward and and cold, calculating politician. He had immediately, you know, of course had his uh, way felt on these lands. But uh, the same Othokar had done um, a lot in this regard and. Um, while some, even Austrians, uh, there were some Austrian noblemen that defected his lines in this context, um, these other lands stood with him, even in numerical inferiority against Othokar, and the one at the splendid battle of Markfeld in 1278 at uh, Dürnkrut, in Spiegen, which is the largest battles of feudal knights in, in history, right? And uh, which Ottokar was killed, by the way. And uh, essentially, the Habsburgic rule in the East Lands was secured, de facto, for good. Of course, other things could have changed dynastically, um, etc. But at this point, the Habsburgs, uh, you know, first of all, having resigned Ottokar. Uh, extended dramatically their power also in, in the rest of Germany. There is this sense that uh, after the death of Frederick II, it was literally not an empire anymore. But telling the truth, until the early 14th century, um, and especially after the Habsburgs uh, were raised to the to the throne of the Romans, because they they were not uh, they would never go to Italy at this point uh, to be crowned Holy Roman Emperors. They actually had a massive power. I mean, at some point they were nominally kings of Bohemia, even of Poland, Albert I, of course, they were just, nor they never went even there with the intention of occupying it, but 
uh, Rudolf, his successors, um, uh, undertook this this massive work of um, systematic uh, subjugation of the rebel princes in Germany. They destroyed as much as 70 castles in, in the Rhineland. It, it was um, a massive power. It was also fueled by these lands. Austria, Styria, Carinthia, Car uh, Carniola, um, and others that now, of course, the Habsburgs uh, already had, for example, in Swabia, in what would become, in a while, Switzerland, as the, the Confederates would rebel from there. Um, but the install let's say, of the Habsburgs in these lands, and in Styria too, uh, is secured at, uh, at this point. Um, there were some legal noisances, uh, but in 1282, um, Rudolf managed to of his sons Albrecht and Rudolf II with Austria, Styria, Carniola, and the Windische Mark. And in 1283, Albert was installed as the sole hereditary sovereign of these lands, importantly enough. So that was, as we've seen, also the Bamberg had done the same in the succession issues, because the German nobility didn't want uh, a single ruler controlling all these lands at a time. So a way was saying, okay, I will entrust them to my son, right? And that's what essentially Rudolf does by keeping, say, the ancestral lands of Swabia and then giving to his, his sons but de facto ruling from, from Vienna um, at different points, this south uh, eastern German lands. Uh, there was also the affirmation of the Habsburgs in 1292 against the aristocratic uprising of the Landsberg League, um, to which also the Styrians participated because again the Habsburgs weren't going lightly on it, right? They were quite iron fisted. Uh, and from then on, uh, so showing that the, the dynasty had, however, enough support from these same lands to, to hold, the Duchy of Syria remained in the possession of the Aus of Habsburg until 1918, right? Albeit with a brief interruption when Matthias Corvinus, that we made a video just a couple of days ago, ruled parts of the country from 1485 to 1490, as he campaigned in Wiener Neustadt, for example, was part of the of the Duchy of Carinthia, and that's where also his black army showed off with uh, the highest of its uh, organic, right, 28,000 uh, men, right, he fortified even the the place, so Syria has a role also in that. Um, in the meanwhile, throughout all this, it's obvious that the land had importantly Germanized. Uh, Austria was the most German, de descending towards the south, as we've seen, there was a bit more of a boundary, Carniola was still a somehow Germano-Slavic reality, for example. In the 12th and 13th century, the immigration of German settlers had increased, especially around Graz and East uh, Styria, um, which, because it was, that was still sparsely populated as a frontier land. Right? So settlement meant towns that could also defend themselves, resist sieges, or even major armies were given time to to the field wants to intervene and, and such things. Land clearing, uh, cultivation expansion continued all uh, across the 13th century. As a consequence, the Slavic um, settlement islands of Western and Upper Styria shrank more and more. So much so that, in fact, what we see today in, in Upper Styria, like Austria, in fact, um, is the disappearance of uh, Slavic uh, presence, which was already a reality by the 14th century, right? Naturally, this doesn't mean that the Slavs were, you know, expelled. They actually were assimilated. Uh, and uh, many people, of course, from Austria have that, that uh, ethnic background, uh, genetically. And south of the uh, Ratkersburg, uh, up to the Drava River, the area was settled according actually to plan by further Slavic colonists instead, now coming from the lower marshes. So whoever could come there, as long as they remained, of course, under the local feudal lords, it was, was okay. They didn't really care. There wasn't an ethnic tension of sorts. Also because there wasn't any major Slavic power around could make leverage on those people. Uh, 
was actually a great opportunity for everybody involved. Um, naturally, in the mid 14th century, we have the plague um, that uh, lasted up to like for five years, causing a strong decline in, in the population. And in Syria is affected by this importantly with uh, the population, even a sort of desertification because many areas were uh, previously cultivated were abandoned and um, nature took over uh, again as it was normal in many areas of Europe especially in Central Europe that was um, more scarcely populated um, you know more or less what Habsburgic history is about during these years we've seen it in the Duchy of Austria right so following the history of Styria is bits like that story too um, after Rudolf the Forts of Habsburg that had elevated uh, this entire lands to an, an archduchy as a response to the, um, the, the the institutional machinations of of Charles of Bohemia with the Golden Bull, the foundation also of uh, the, the University of Vienna. So, th properly, the, the rise of Austria as a as a major player in the empire by not a, not a voter. That was actually what the Luxembourgs did at the expense of the Habsburgs. Um, there was, famously enough, a major event, um, in, in fact, happening at the death of the same Rudolf in 1365, uh, that is the split of the Habsburgic dynasty. Like many others, as we've seen, this happens in late medieval times with the German principalities in two lines, known as the Albertian line and the Le Le Leopoldian one because of the name of uh, their founders. Uh, as a consequence, the the ancestral and the newly acquired lands of the Augsburgs were split in two, and they started behaving like two separated um, principalities. N naturally, this importantly weakened Habsburgic power um, in the process, because uh, they wouldn't be re reunited until um, until the 15th century. In 1379, the division in the Treaty of Neuburg saw Styria with Carinthia, Tyrol, and neighboring countries falling to Leopold III. Vuz sons again divided the inheritance in 1406. And at that point, Styria was awarded to the Ernestine branch. Um, this was the first of the two line divisions of the Habsburgs in, in their ancestral lands in the southeast of the empire. Ernst um, ruled Styria. Uh, there is a bit of, in fact, of a he is uh, known as a bit like the, the Iron Man because he was much of a fighter. Um, and there is even a 17th century myth uh, claiming that he defeated the Turks uh, at a battle in Radkersburg in 1418 in Syria, but there is no historical evidence of that. In fact, um, it was rather Hungary that had devastated Eastern Syria that same year. Right, so that's how legions sometimes can count to be. But don't think from an Austrian perspective that you know Hungary is not more like, especially after the Turkish wars, like basically the Turks. Um, given that, as you know, most of Hungary laid in the Ottoman Empire later on. So, but we're talking about modern historiographical myths. Um, nevertheless, this is quite an eloquent example of how, still, as we've seen by the 15th century, it was normal for the Hungarians. We've seen it also with Matthias Corbinus later in time to uh, harass these areas like they are if, if there is a war between Hungary and Austria of course that's the the, the major theater of operations at least one of the uh, the most obvious ones right for the group of countries administered from Graz Styria, Carinthia, Carniola, the county of Görlitz, Gorizia from 1500 even the city of Trieste and the uh, Windischmark, uh, the term Inner Austria became common. So Graz, as the Syrian capital, was really an international center at this point, in spite of the feudal uh, issues, right? Not, as we've seen, a particularly powerful one per se, or even just as a Syrian base. It was part as a, of a broader dynastic sum of possessions that uh, were essentially expanding the, the Habsburgic um, power, especially towards the south, towards Italy, uh, with the Venetian border at this point is becoming. Um, 
and the eldest son and successor of Ernest since 1424 was the later uh, Emperor Frederick III uh, of, of Habsburg, who in turn united all his family's lands after the other lines had died out, because that's how it would normally end. If you've ever been in family struggles, you know how you know complicated they, they can be. So yes, that's you know the Habsburgic version of the story. Needless to say, with Frederick the Third, um, Habsburgic power instead comes back prepotently on the fore in, in European policy. Um, Frederick lived uh, in different Austrian cities. He stayed in Graz, uh, however, for the longest time, namely 40 years, witnessing how much of an ad administrative and political center it had, the city had become. In fact, it's uh, exactly uh, this time that the castle and the cathedral of Graz uh, were expanded in late Gothic style, as you can still admire uh, today. Uh, when the Counts of Celia died out in 1456, Frederick III acquired their possessions too on the basis of earlier um, feudal contracts. Also in 1462, Syria was um, organized in quarters, administered. Syria actually had interesting economic resources, especially in the upper part that uh, had provided, especially through mining, an important economical development of the country from the same local resources during the 12th century. Um, mostly it was salt mining, as, we, as we've seen a bit like Salzburg comparatively. Um, the most important mines were located in Bad Ause Hall and in the uh, Hall Valley near Mariazell. There was also iron mining on the Erzberg and in uh, Jonsbach, and silver mining in Oberzeiring and Schladming. And the iron ore was melted in relatively primitive kilns, um, given that the land was not particularly on the form, so kind of technological development, but still there was a, an important working effort. Um, in fact, uh, already from you know, the 13th century you see wheel works, uh, which are smelting furnaces in which the bellows were driven by water heels, more modernly. Um, and Surely that's a moment of important metallurgical development all over Europe. Um, then there was some spin-off, let's say, of related to iron production. Um, there is also the salt boiling in Ausse that was so important locally to be taken over by the Styrian Duke, who ran the business with properly hired workers as early as 1449. There are also the salt springs near Admont, which are operated by uh, the local abbey that we have seen before, the one of in, in the Halt uh, Valley near Mariazel by the abbey of St. Landbrecht, that I inserted some of the pictures here, you realize also was an imposing, it still is, but it was expanded afterwards, but um, those were very important, monas powerful monastic foundations. In the mid-15th century, the Styrian Duke also intervened to regulate the iron industry. There were important armories um, that you can still admire in, in the land. Um, and, however, trade was relatively, uh, let's say, controlled by the by the duke right this was mostly a feudal area so you don't find much of a uh, I, I don't know guild autonomy and uh, kind of or in unstoppable communal forces that the feudal authority has to struggle against there is a beautiful picture um, of the plagues on the Graz cathedral that was created in 1485 that basically follows the general style in the late medieval Europe about the memento mori in a sense, right, and shows what 
uh, you know what what but lifestyle mentality was uh, at the time which is of course one dominated by piety by fear of you know of judgment of the ultimate um, one and uh, generally speaking of hunger war epidemics per se uh, hunger is symbolized by the locusts um, which already at that time by the end of the 15th century were referring to the Turks right so the general idea of war right of divine wrath manifesting in these peoples coming from God knows were to torment in fact the southern uh, German lands that as you know become a target of the Ottoman raids and they're the one of their proxies right in in the frontier with the Empire especially after you know Hungary was becoming more permeable to them um, and in fact the same Hungarians uh, as we've seen had a bit worn that cloth in, in the Austrian mentality um, as we've seen the expedition of King Matthias Corvinus um, had brought to important devastations. There had been the uprising of the former imperial mercenary Andreas Baumkirch uh, that shows the difficulties, of course, also in maintaining control of some um, professional soldiers, um, captains of, uh, of, of fortune in these uh, complicated dynastic conflicts. But again, especially epidemics such as the plague of 1480 surely affected that kind of art we can admire uh, in Graz. Um, the, the Turkish invasions would become, however, the uh, soon the, the most important concern. The son and successor of Frederick III, uh, the Emperor Maximilian I, set up in Styria administrative authorities in the hereditary lands to cope also with the needs of defense by local militias but also for his broader military reforms we made a video about the Landsknecht uh, just a few weeks ago that can illustrate well uh, the time and the spirit and the attempts of the Habsburg to create a sort of super state that could hegemonize uh, the em Germany, especially the Empire, hopefully. Um, and uh, Maximilian, for this purpose, also expanded the castle of Graz, right? Uh, for example, the stair tower with the famous Gothic double spiral staircase dates back to his times. In 1496, also the Jews were expelled from Styria, as was happening in other countries in Europe think about Spain um, with which now as you know also the Habsburgs were um, married into um, this was uh, decided to conform kind of the the Habsburgic lands in the absence of I don't know saints uh, or in, in the dynasty and or um, actually the same major power that France um, could have with a strong Catholic uh, orthodoxy that however damaged as far as the expulsion of the Jews was concerned um, because uh, they provided a lot of with a lot of trade a lot of income but it was more important ideological for the Habsburgs to strengthen the feudal hierarchy and um, let's say even decreasing those uh, mercantile activities then uh, in str strengthening uh, orthodoxy then than, than else. Um, many of the Syrian Jews were however settled in lower Austria where they could be more easily integrated at least uh, even though they had been dispersed as such in Western Hungary even. Um, so the history of Styria at this point uh, is already Habsburgic as you understand from quite a while and the duchy uh, wouldn't ever grow again like a say an autonomous principality right he was just a relatively insignificant part of the Habsburgic possessions on which proverbially the sun never set especially after the 
discovery of the Americas by uh, Columbus at the service of Castilla and thus what would have become an Habsburgic possession soon uh, after the, the Catholic kings, which as you know of course opens in many ways to modernity, at the thresholds of which we conclude our video that is always themed um, uh, chronologically uh, on the Middle Ages. So you have here a, a broader picture of the Syrian lands. Naturally when I make these um, European regions uh, videos I I always intend, I literally intend them as a very short introduction which is a way you can find the video through the title also more easily. Uh, I have an entire playlist of this stuff and plus all the various um, policies in which these countries fit of course um, uh, I have a playlist dedicated to them where you can find in turn these videos and so on. So I'm trying to essentially create this major mosaic of all the various historical regions of Europe throughout the, the Middle Ages, but it's obvious that, as you know, I also concentrate on other, um, uh, let's say, on more in-depth content, so that we will surely come across hysteria again, and we will hopefully also observe other aspects, let's say, of scattered here and there in other videos that are also not just teamed after it. So that's why it's important to stick around. Sometimes, like, just to make you an example, b the, the other day I made a video like European Kingdoms that got kind of double views during the 10th century, double views compared to the ones I normally get from this other uh, ch um, content. Then I make a video about Henry III's England, right, in, in the 13th century, and, you know, I don't know, I think the, the latter is much more important, gets half of the, half of the views. And I realized that people, of course, want, or at least are more prone to, just to seek the, the cheaper kind of general comprehensive uh, thing, right? That video about European kingdoms lasted two hours and it was a specific analysis of European kingdoms, not even empires or whatever, specifically that, in comparison as a foreword to the actual historiographical interpretation to 10th century state building, the Regna and so on. So, I I realize psychologically what 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 goes on, but the point is that you cannot even understand the 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 general content, even though I make it, make it intelligible per se. If you don't enter the nuances of the more in depth ones, right? Because you know I make the video, and at least as far as you know my curriculum is concerned, I know something about that. But there is the the concrete risk that a person who is not from a strictly historical background that can't simply listen to this and doesn't even say, but maybe this video is boring because I wanted like a li I thought it was just like a, a cartoonish list of of kingdoms and saying, oh my God, what were these were was stronger this kind of thing. Now it it's a matter of political, institutional, historiographical, and um, you know ideological and politicological analysis, which has hardly anything to do. And if you want to look at the actual essences of countries, this type of content, like today's video, is the best. Because you can appreciate, especially from the same country's uh, point of view, what, what also the, the various powers in Europe actually were, rather than having, and how they measured with each other too, without having this kind of generalistic blob in which you hope that you're country with your flag like a football team wins the match, right? Because history has nothing to do with that. <laughs> you know, that has to do with, um, you know, diseased fourth estate. It doesn't have to do with with accomplished individuals. Um, and one must maintain an authority, an order, a discipline, and a standard at the end of the day, because without that, uh, you can't really have anything, including a knowledge of your own history, which at this point of educational system, um, you you really don't have no, nobody really has on average right and so um, I'm doing this series because it's unique in its kind on YouTube it's um, at least I I have some numbers to, to make it and it's accompanied by lots of other content that is connected with it historically and that can therefore form this thick net where you can literally say 
I want to see this country, this place, in this different times, and you can find through the playlist the whole thing. And I think it's it's quite interesting as a project, and I see that you tendentially appreciate. But we need to make this count, uh, this 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 country, this channel grow consistently, because it, it's also a way of making actually any policy stronger. Because if you don't know your history, you can't really go anywhere. However, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoy it. This video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time